thank you very much. Can you hear me? No. Without a microphone? No. no. Need the microphone. Okay. All right. How's that? Is that better? Huh? Keep it close. All right. Um, okay. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, back in Marblehead at the uh, your wonderful historical society in this historic, great historic uh, building. Uh, and my latest book, The War of 1812, was written for the uh, bicentennial of the war. Um, and um, the, the part that Marblehead played in the War of 1812 is, uh, has partially remained hidden in the sense that most of the activity for Marblehead during the war uh, was uh, through her privateers. Uh, to give you an idea of how much energy Marblehead put into privateers during the War of 1812, um, out of, uh, let's say, um, the number of young men who served on privateers out of Marblehead. We don't have an exact figure, but it's about 800. Um, the number of young men who served in the Navy uh, was, was probably 50. It certainly was under, uh, under 100. And the number who served in the Army uh, was probably less than 25. So Marblehead put its energy uh, principally uh, into privateers during this time. Um, how well those privateers did is a matter of, of, uh, of dispute among historians. Some historians think privateers were hugely important in the war. Other, other, other uh, historians don't think so. Uh, myself, I think the privateers were very important. Certainly President, President Madison thought they were, uh, and I'll come to that uh, in a minute. The most famous episode that concerned Marblehead was the USS Essex and its voyage uh, to the South Pacific. And uh, I, will, I will come back to that. Uh, I, always, uh, I always get a question about that <clears throat> in, this, uh, in this neighborhood. Um, anyway, let me, let me give you a broad overview of the, of the War of 1812. Uh, I divide it up into three uh, segments. The first segment went from uh, June of 1812 when the war started to February of uh, 1813 um, when Washington found out that Napoleon had been defeated. The second uh, period goes from February of 1813 until April of 1814 when Napoleon was finally defeated. And the last part goes from, from April of 1814 to um, February of 1815 when the war uh, finally came to an end. So let me take up the first period. The war started in, in June of, uh, of 1812. Uh, President Madison asked Congress to uh, declare war against the British. Uh, the British did not want us to do this. Uh, Madison was very angry. He had been working for years to try to resolve our differences with England. He could not. They would not listen to us. Uh, they would not seriously negotiate with us. Uh, and he had had enough. And finally, he asked Congress to declare war. For, he, had three, he had three reasons for doing so. One, uh, the British were impressing our sailors and had been impressing our sailors for decades and decades. And it got worse and worse as, as uh, the uh, War of 1812 approached. Um, and um, the second reason that uh, he wanted to declare war was the way England had been treating our trade, uh, interfering with our trade. And again, that had been getting worse and worse as the war against Napoleon uh, proceeded. And the third reason was that uh, the British were inciting Indians on the frontier against our settlers. Uh, we, we thought that uh, it wasn't that the settlers were trying to take over Indian territory. The problem was that the British were in, inciting them. So these are the three reasons that he cited in going to war with Great Britain. 
Now, uh, it was interesting that the, that the President of the United States was asking the country to go to war when uh, we had practically no army and almost no navy, and the country was politically uh, divided. Uh, if you think the country is politically divided now, uh, it's, it's, it's nothing compared to what it was uh, then. Uh, the vote for the war was very close. Uh, a large, no, no member of the Federalist Party, which was one of the great parties at the time, uh, voted for it. And some members of the other party, which was Madison's party, uh, the Republicans, some of those didn't vote for it either. So it was very close in voting, uh, voting for the war. So the president is taking the country to war, no army, no navy, and, and, and uh, politically, politically divided. Was he crazy? Well, his, op his opponents thought so. Uh, the Federalists, who were very strong in New England, uh, were, uh, were, were very angry with him for this basic reason. They said, what are you going to war against England for uh, when they are fighting our fight? If they are fighting Napoleon, if Napoleon wins, uh, he's going to invade England. If he beats England, we are next. Uh, you're, 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 you're declaring war on the wrong country. Um, and um, Madison, on the other hand, uh, and his Republican followers thought, if we don't do this now, we can't call ourselves an independent country. We can't allow our men to be impressed. We can't allow them to treat our trade the way they are. We can't go on in, in this fashion uh, being treated like a colony as if we had never won our independence. It's now or never. Um, so uh, he, he, he made out this case, Madison. He said, yeah, we don't have much of an army, we don't have much of a navy, uh, but we can, we can get the British to negotiate our differences for this reason. Number one, Napoleon is invading Russia. And as you remember, Napoleon invaded Russia in June of 1812, exactly at the same time that we were declaring war uh, against England. For months prior, prior to this invasion of Russia, uh, Napoleon had been building an army up on the, on the Russian border. Uh, and by June of 1812, that army had, had gotten to, to uh, 600,000 plus troops, the largest army uh, in, in world history. Uh, and nobody thought the Russians were going to withstand this invasion. They all knew it was coming in June, and in June it did come. And, and Napoleon uh, pushed into, uh, into Russia, and everybody thought it would take him just a few weeks to defeat Russia. Once he defeated Russia, uh, he would then be master of Europe. And, and, and in very short order, he would then turn against the, uh, against the uh, British. So Madison thought with this kind of pressure on them, the British would negotiate their differences uh, with us on impressment, uh, on trade, and on the, uh, on the Indians. Um, the second thing Madison said, we're going to invade Canada. Canada, even though we have a weak army and practically no navy, Canada is there for the taking because the British are so occupied in Europe, they, don't, they can't defend Canada, and Canada is loaded with people who have, who have emigrated from the United States and really don't support the king there, and so he thought it would be very easy to, to uh, take at least a big chunk of Canada, if not all of Canada and use that as a negotiating tool to get, to get the British to uh, agree uh, uh, to uh, change their policies. The third thing that Madison was going to use to win this war, besides the army and the navy, was uh, privateers. Our, our real navy, as far as he was concerned, were going to be privateers. Uh, and uh, the privateers, remember, in the, in, during the revolution had played a big role uh, in, in, in winning that uh, victory in the sense that they wore the British down gradually over time. Uh, and so Madison expected hundreds of privateers to uh, set out from the United States and in fact 526 privateers uh, uh, did uh, uh, set out and they did have an impact. It took a while but they did have uh, an impact in the war. So they were to be our Navy. Now, 
what about our real Navy? Well, our real Navy, as far as Madison was concerned, uh, uh, was irrelevant. He thought that, that they might as well stay in port. Uh, if they ventured, if ventured out of port, they were going to be captured by the British, as it happened during the Revolution. We had, at the time, 20 warships. The British had 1,000. Uh, 700 of their ships were at sea constantly. 300 were being repaired or being built in their shipyards. Of our 20, only 14 were, were actually serviceable. So other six were being repaired. A couple of them uh, uh, were so far gone they never, they never got to sea anyway. So Madison didn't think the American Navy would be a factor uh, at all. Okay. So what happened during this first period from June uh, 1812 to February of 1813? What actually happened? Well, none of it went the way Madison thought it was going to go. Uh, in the first place, Napoleon got defeated. Uh, he, was, he was relying mainly on Napoleon to bring the British around, and here he is, he got defeated. He was defeated in, in a very short period of time. So by December, uh, of 1812, Napoleon is, is in a sleigh fleeing from the Russian battlefield with one aide, just the two of them, fleeing back to Paris, crossing the Polish border, and, and, and driving all this way across Europe. The British, the British are hoping, the Russians are hoping that someone will kill him. Nobody kills him. He reaches Paris uh, in the middle of December, the day, the day after the French discovered what a great disaster his campaign uh, in Russia was. So he, he in, instead of a, an opposition forming to him, he picked up the reins of power very quickly and he, he started building a new uh, uh, army. Uh, but nonetheless, he had been, he has, had been defeated. And Madison found out about it uh, in, in uh, February. Uh, what, what and that changed everything. Uh, what happened to the Canadian invasion? The Canadian invasion also had been a disaster. The, the uh, American army invaded at three different points. Uh, at Detroit, where it was defeated on August 15. Uh, and the, the British not only defeated our army at Detroit, but uh, they took over all of the northwestern part of the United States. So instead of Madison uh, uh, carving out a piece of Canada, the British were carving out a big piece uh, of the United States. The army was also invading in the Niagara area uh, and, and in uh, Montreal. Uh, all of, both of these were, were, were tragic failures uh, as, as well. Uh, so, so the privateers uh, set out, but uh, they, didn't, they didn't have really time to, to uh, put enough pressure on the English for uh, Madison's uh, negotiations to, to uh, take place. So it looked as if his entire strategy had, had, uh, uh, had been uh, defeated. What about the Navy? Well, the Navy was the only bright spot during this time for him. Um, the, first, the first inkling of what the Navy was actually going to do came on August 12th just three days before Detroit, when the USS Essex, built in Essex, Massachusetts, captained by a guy named David Porter, beat a, 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 a British ship called the Alert. Uh, curious thing, you know, the American Navy wasn't supposed to do anything. It wasn't supposed to win uh, any, any battles of any kind against the British. Um, the British were surprised about, uh, about this. Madison was surprised, but, the Essex was a 32-gun frigate, and the Alert was a much smaller uh, vessel. It was a warship, but much, much smaller. was 20 guns. Uh, and um, although Porter defeated it very easily, still the disparity in, in, in weaponry didn't, uh, didn't upset people in either capital. Okay, that's the 12th. On the 15th, the, the defeat at Detroit. On the 19th of August, 1812, Comes, comes another naval victory. The USS Constitution, 800 miles east of Boston, defeats a British frigate, the Guerriere. The Guerriere is not weak like the Alert 
is. The Guerriere is one of Britain's top frigates. Uh, it is a, a bit smaller than the Constitution, but nonetheless, uh, Britain expects their, their warships, no matter what the disparity in power, certainly their frigates to, to win in a one-on-one -on -one contest with the Americans. This single battle uh, was of huge importance to the British. Word reached London that it happened a month later, uh, and you would think that Napoleon had, was marching in, in London. Uh, they were so uh, upset. Why were they so upset? They were so upset because the British Navy was their only defense. Uh, without the British Navy, uh, the French were going to easily take them over. Uh, so the aura of invincibility of the British Navy was of huge importance to them. And to have the Americans, who had the, they had always disparaged, uh, have the Americans defeat them so easily on a one-on-one -on -one ship battle uh, disturbed them uh, no end. Madison all of a sudden decided that he was in love with the Navy. Uh, up until this time, uh, he, had, he literally had no use for it. Uh, in fact, he had fought against even building a Navy going back to Washington's time. You remember uh, in Washington's time, Washington is the president, Madison is the head of the House of Representatives. Uh, and there was a tug of war between the two of them, although they were very close in lots of ways, on whether or not the country ought to build a Navy. And, and, and Jefferson, who was the Secretary of State, supported Madison, or Madison supported Jefferson. They, they were both against building a navy at all. Uh, George Washington and then John Adams wanted to build a navy, and this debate went on until the War of 1812. Jefferson, when he was president, and Madison kept the navy small. Uh, so Madison was known as an anti-navy uh, politician, and indeed he had been. But here, after the victory of the Constitution, he all of a sudden falls in love with the Navy. 1812 happened to be a, an election year. Uh, he, ha he suffered this terrible defeat in, uh, at Detroit, uh, and he needs something to offset that. So it's, it's going to be the Navy. Uh, and not only, not only uh, is the Navy helping, himself with, helping him with this victory, but uh, Four more times in individual battles between June of 1812 and February of, of uh, 1813, uh, the Navy, the U.S. Navy, defeats uh, a, 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 a British warship, uh, which, which changed the whole attitude of the British and the Americans towards, towards their Navy. Uh, in December of 1812, in January, a big debate occurred in Washington uh, about uh, uh, whether or not the country really was going to have a serious Navy and, and if it was going to, going to start building it right then. And Madison and the Republicans in Congress, supported by the Federalists. The Federalists who would, who would oppose Madison on everything did not, did not oppose him on the Navy. So they got uh, uh, a legislation through that, uh, uh, that uh, transformed the American Navy from a, a service that was barely put up with by, by the country to one which, which now uh, was uh, a, a bulwark of our uh, defense. Okay, let me go on, fast forward here uh, to, um, to the next period, uh, eight, February of 1813 to April of 1814. Um, in February of, of 1813, a big debate occurred in Parliament over uh, the American policy. They were mad as hell at us. They wanted to get back at us. The British thought we had stabbed them in the back in June when they were vulnerable, when it looked like Napoleon was going to win. Uh, and they were very angry uh, about that. Now that Napoleon had been defeated in Russia and they felt less pressure, they wanted to get back at us. And this whole debate, disturbing debate, when you read it, in, in the House of Lords and the House of Parliament was all about uh, getting back at the United States. Now, they couldn't do that immediately because they still had Napoleon to deal with. He had gotten back to Paris, he was raising an army. So all through 1813, really until April of 1814, uh, the British have to deal with, with Napoleon. Uh, he is finally defeated and sent to Elba in April of 1814. 
uh, and in all this time, have the English, have the English uh, cooled off towards the Americans? No. Uh, their anger towards us is, is building, all through 1813 um, into 1814. I'll come back to 1813 uh, if you want in, in, when we uh, get to the question and answer period. But let me fast forward to April of 1814. What were the British, after Napoleon was defeated, the British now had their big navy, they had their army, the army that, that had helped to defeat Napoleon. What were they gonna do to us? What did they wanna do, uh, do to us? Here's what they wanted to do. They were going to dismember the United States. They were going to break us up. They were going to permanently weaken us. Make sure that, that we would never be a rival uh, on this continent or on the, on the high seas. They were going to break off Louisiana. They had never recognized the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. Uh, but now they were going to break Louisiana off. They were going to unite all of Louisiana with Canada, and they were going to they were going to also also push their uh, territory west to the Pacific uh, to Astoria, at the mouth of the uh, Columbia River. In 1813, they had taken over an American settlement uh, in in Astoria, and they were going to move Canada down to New Orleans and then out to uh, out to the Pacific. Spain at this time was crumbling, the Spanish Empire in, in, uh, in North America. And so the British also had their eye on the southwestern part of the United States, which is now uh, Texas and Arizona, New Mexico, uh, and California. Very sparsely populated, uh, and uh, uh, Spain at this point uh, was actually dependent on the British. The British also were interested in Florida, they're interested in, in, uh, in Cuba, in Puerto Rico, in the Spanish possessions uh, in, uh, in the West Indies. So they had, they had great ambitions uh, in that way. They also wanted to break off New England uh, from, from the United States. Uh, the, uh, New England had, had been very unhappy about the war. Uh, the Federalist Party uh, was in control of the governments in New England. Uh, and uh, they, there was a lot, some talk about making a separate peace with the English. The English really picked up on this. Uh, the political situation in New England was, was much different with, than what the British thought it was. Opinion here was divided. There were a lot of people who didn't want to do anything like that. But they thought that, that sitting in London and, and, and looking at what was happening over here, they liked to think that New England was going to uh, split off and they were going to encourage us uh, in that direction. So how are they going to accomplish all this? First of all, they were going to invade us. They were going to send an army down from Canada. They were going to send an army to New Orleans and push up the Mississippi. They were going to send an army uh, to uh, invade Georgia and, and, and uh, in South Carolina. Um, they were also going to conduct large-scale raids along the American uh, coast uh, to, so, to um, divert the, uh, our attention away from the invasions coming from Canada and uh, from, from New Orleans. Um, <clears throat> now, it took them a while to get all these forces <clears throat> and all of this uh, manpower and so on over here to conduct these invasions. So they really weren't ready until the summer of 1814. Uh, and the, the, first, the first battle, the first great battle uh, of this uh, that occurred uh, was when they burned Washington, August 24, uh, 1814. One of their one of their large scale raids, the largest, uh, was conducted with, with only 4,500 of their troops, and these troops marched into Washington uh, very easily and, and burned it. These 4,500 troops came from Europe. They had been fighting Napoleon. Uh, they, they had been, the troops had been fighting Napoleon for seven years without a break. And they thought when he, and when he was defeated finally in April of 1814 that um, they were going home. Instead of going home, they were put on troop transports 
and sent to Bermuda. Uh, imagine what a wonderful ride that was. Uh, and when they got to Bermuda, uh, they, some of them were sent to Canada, and, and some of them conducted these large-scale raids uh, along the coast. The biggest one against Washington, 4,500 tired, uh, I imagine they weren't too happy, disease-ridden men uh, landed uh, just outside Washington, unopposed at a place called Benedict. They moved up unopposed to Bladensburg, seven miles from the capital. And at Bladensburg, uh, some opposition, 7,000 American troops, 1,000 regulars, 6,000 militiamen just collapsed. The British pushed them aside uh, and, and marched into Washington that very day and started to, to burn it. In other words, there was, no, there was no defense of our capital whatsoever. The fires were put out because there was a hurricane the next day. It was the biggest, it was the biggest storm that, that uh, anybody could have remembered. It may have been the biggest storm in Washington's history. Um, and uh, that storm put out the fire and it killed more British troops than the Americans had uh, when, at the invasion. Uh, when the storm was over, the British commanders uh, marched their troops back to the ships and and uh, off they went, because these were going to be just raids. They were not taking territory at this point. Um, okay. Two days later, in the British invasion force, 3,000 men land in Castine, Maine, unopposed, and take the whole eastern section of Maine, again, unopposed, from the Penobscot River to, the, to, Penobscot, to Penobscot, Passamaquoddy Bay, uh, was now uh, British territory. Um, Okay, a month later, news of these two victories reached London, and the Prime Minister was ecstatic. His big plan was working. The Prime Minister was named Liverpool, a wonderful, interesting character. Uh, his Foreign Minister was a guy named Castlereagh. Uh, the plans of, of the picture they had of the British Empire in, now in North America was stupendous. Um, and. Um, they couldn't have been more pleased. And it was being done on the cheap. It wasn't costing them very much. Um, okay, two weeks later, two weeks later, um, a great battle occurred in, in uh, uh, Lake Champlain off of Plattsburgh, in Plattsburgh Bay. The British invasion that was coming down from Canada, uh, it started on September 1st. They crossed the border, very large army, over 10,000 men with a fleet in Lake Champlain that was supporting them. Uh, the commander of the troops, uh, the commander of the overall invasion, uh, assumed that, that, that his fleet in Lake Champlain would brush aside the puny American fleet that was there to, to contest uh, the invasion. Um, he, he just assumed that. Uh, he, had, he had three of Wellington's best generals who had, who had fought and defeated the French uh, a very short time before. It, it looked very promising, this invasion coming down from Canada. Who knew how far he was going to go? Was he going to go as far as Albany? Was he going to New York City? Where were they going to go? Where were they going to stop? Nobody knew. Well, a funny thing happened. Uh, in two weeks, two weeks later, uh, the American Navy defeated the British fleet on Lake Champlain. A guy named McDonough with a, a, fleet, that, uh, a fleet that was not as big or potent as the British fleet uh, defeated uh, the British on Lake Champlain. Once that happened, the British general turned around and left. He went back to Canada. He went back to Canada because uh, and if, if his supplies could not move uh, down the lake, his invasion could not, uh, could not work. At least that's what he, he assumed. And so uh, it, was, it was miraculous. One day they were the great conquerors who were going to march, who knows, to New York City. The next day they were marching back to Canada and the British Army was deserting in droves. Nobody knew how many people, how many of the men actually got back to, uh, uh, to Canada. Um, At the very same time, 
at the very same time, uh, the army that had in, that, that had had burned Washington attacked Baltimore. And uh, when I say they attacked Baltimore, they prepared to attack Baltimore. A very large uh, British fleet, uh, the same number of troops, the same troops that had succeeded in Washington, uh, were coming to invade uh, Baltimore. They began bombing uh, Baltimore, and you remember the, the and they had bombed, they bombed Baltimore for a whole day, 24 hours, and you remember Francis Scott Key was on one of the British boats by chance. <coughs> And uh, after 24 hours of them bombarding Fort McHenry, which was a key part of the defense of Baltimore, after seeing the British bombs going off in the air for all this time, uh, in the morning he saw this huge American flag still flying and he was inspired to write a poem that became the national anthem. Well, what actually happened at Baltimore was that Baltimore's defense, unlike Washington, was very solid. And it was solid because Two men worked very closely together. One was John Rogers, who was a Commodore uh, and the uh, senior American officer in the Navy. He worked very closely uh, with the, the uh, Army commander, a, a man named Smith, who was also a, a U.S. Senator, who was head of the militia uh, in Baltimore. And the two of these guys working together is what saved Baltimore. Now, uh, beforehand, thinking of these two characters working together was like thinking of Nimitz and MacArthur working together. Nobody thought it was going to happen. Uh, and instead of that, it was love affair. The two of them worked hand in glove. And they put up a defense of Baltimore on the water and on the land that the British commander, uh, his name was Admiral Cochrane, uh, when he saw these defenses, even though he bombarded, he could see he wasn't going to go any further uh, because he was afraid that, that John Rogers was going to defeat his big fleet and he didn't want that to happen. And so he pulled the whole thing back uh, and, 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 and it was a, he pretended that he, that he wasn't forced to pull, pull back, but of course uh, he was. And, and when word of, of this reached London a month later, uh, uh, it, it created a huge political firestorm. Everything changed uh, in England when re the report came of the defeat at, at, uh, in Lake Champlain and the defeat at Baltimore. Uh, this wasn't supposed to happen. Remember, the British had been fighting Napoleon and the French since 1792, okay? A very, very long time. And the Prime Minister recognized that if, if he could do to the United States what he wanted to on the cheap and quickly, that would be fine. But if it was going to be a tough, long war, he didn't want any part of it. So, so the, the victory on Lake Champlain, the victory at Baltimore, uh, changed Britain completely, and the Prime Minister decided he'd sue for peace. Uh, just turned around like that. Uh, and and uh, a peace treaty was agreed on on December 24, 1814, in very short order. Uh, okay, quickly, New Orleans. Uh, the New Orleans invasion uh, couldn't be stopped. They didn't get word of the peace treaty. So the Battle of New Orleans was a series of battles, the biggest one, January 8, 1815. Uh, and Admiral Cochrane, same guy as at Baltimore and at at Washington. Uh, he, he was in charge in, uh, in New Orleans. Uh, then Wellington's brother-in-law named Peckenham, Pockenham, um, was the general. And you know the story. They suffered this terrible defeat at the hands of Andrew Jackson. Now, Andrew Jackson was the indispensable man, no question, uh, that he was a great general and won a great victory here. What isn't known, what's in my book, is the role of the U.S. Navy in New Orleans was huge. And Jackson admitted this. The, the American Navy played a critical role in winning, uh, in winning that battle. It was a very minuscule number of, of American <coughs> ships and men. <coughs> and and uh, uh, what they did, you'd have to know the details of all of this, what they did was indispensable to, to defeating uh, the British. So these three great victories, New Orleans, Baltimore, and and Lake Champlain changed Britain's attitude uh, towards the United States. Um, 
And um, let me quickly go through this very, very quickly before I get to your questions. Um, this change in Britain's attitude towards the United States was the biggest outcome of the war. It not only changed the relationship between the two great English-speaking countries, it changed world history. Um, just think of this. Think of all of the things that we had to fight with the English about during this period. Think of the whole border with Canada, unsettled. Uh, Spanish, Spain is collapsing. The whole Florida, Cuba, Caribbean, uh, the whole southwestern part of the United States. We could fight endlessly with the British over all that, not to mention all the problems that we had with them at, at sea. And um, these, these problems did not go away after the war. Uh, they were there, but all of them were settled peacefully. The whole Canadian border dispute. Just think, where has it been in world history uh, a, a border of that length uh, uh, that, that had so many uh, areas contested between the two countries that were settled peacefully over a long period of time. So from 1815 to, to after the Civil War, 1870, the two countries sorted out these uh, problems. They were hotheads on both sides wanted another war, but when they thought about it, both sides always backed off, going back and thinking about what had happened in, in uh, 1812. After 1870, Germany becomes united and becomes a much bigger problem for the English, and, and, and England draws even closer to the United States. And you know in the 20th century, the great role that the English-speaking people played in saving the world from, from Nazism, Stalinism, uh, you name it, and continue in this century to the, be the basis of world peace uh, that, we have, uh, that we have now. So this was the major outcome of this war, this change in relationship between the United States and Britain. They, the British decided that peace with the United States was vital to them, and this left the United States free to expand all the way to the Pacific, and, and, and without a war, until we, we uh, inflicted the Civil War on, our, on ourselves. Second thing, Madison conducted the war without changing the Constitution. Nobody at that time thought that any, that any country could conduct a war without the president becoming a dictator and, and ripping up the uh, Constitution. Madison didn't do that. He, 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 never, he never changed, uh, deviated from the Constitution at all. He never tried to shut off his opponents, never tried to jail Federalists, uh, never tried to do anything that was unconstitutionally proved to the world and to ourselves that we could, we could operate under our constitution in, in, in any eventuality. And this was a huge lesson for the United States and very important in, in our, uh, our future politics and our future great agreement on our constitution. Third thing that happened was uh, the people who fought the war got the vote, a lot of them. A lot of them, because of property qualifications, couldn't vote. And so uh, they, these guys were not going to go forward and not be able to vote. So they lowered the, got the property qualifications lowered. Uh, and so American democracy was immensely strengthened uh, because of the war. Fourth thing that happened, this is the end of my list, don't get worried. Uh, <laughs> The fourth thing that happened is the Federalist Party practically disappeared. They were discredited because they had opposed the war so vigorously right until the, uh, until the bitter end. And so at the end of the war, the United States was strong. It was strong militarily, it was strong uh, uh, politically, and, and uh, for these reasons, the, the, the British uh, respected us uh, and changed their whole policy. Uh, towards us, and that is why this war is so important in our history and in world history. I always talk too much, Pam. Anyway, I'm going to end it there. Uh, how are we doing on time? Uh, yeah, I want to answer whatever questions. I'd rather hear what questions you have. If you want me to talk about the Essex, I will, if you're interested in that. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Ah, thanks. And, you know, what was their role? The privateers in Marblehead? Yeah. 
the uh, this is this is a this is one of my favorite subjects, the privateers. Um, The question is to, to say something about a Marblehead privateers in the war. Okay. Um, let me tell you about, about privateers. There were 526 of them. Uh, President Madison signed the commission for every single privateer. He did not want to have happen in this war what happened in the revolution. The revolution, nobody knew how many privateers set out because the states uh, issued commissions along with, along with the Continental Congress and so there were, there, nobody knew exactly how many there were out there. Uh, papers were forged. Uh, if you know, if you're a privateer or pretend to be a privateer and you don't have a commission, and the British capture you, they're going to hang you uh, as pirates. You're a pirate. Okay. So uh, we had 526. Mo uh, the the city that that sent the most privateers was Baltimore, uh, and the the area that sent the most was, was New England, uh, and each of the, the New England uh, towns and, and cities sent their, their uh, portions. And I don't have the exact number for Marblehead, but they sent a, uh, you can take seven or 800 men and divide it up among these privateers uh, and, and get whatever number of, of, uh, of ships there were generally. Um, the, the, um, uh, privateers always tried to have as many men on their ships as possible uh, so that when they captured uh, an enemy ship they could then put some of their men on it so that that ship could be brought into port where they where it could be adjudicated and they could they could get their uh, they could get their money and Madison kept very strict control over over the uh, over this part of the uh, business and it was taxed the money they got uh, from that was uh, was uh, was taxed. Now, what kind of an effect did they uh, did? Well, let me let me say this: the privateers were 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 some were uh, let's say the size of them were varied. It got bigger as the war went on, as it did during the Revolution. They got bigger, but uh, they some of them were very small, uh, and and some of them were medium sized and some of them were large. A large privateer would carry thirty guns. A 30-gun privateer uh, was, a, was a formidable uh, fighting machine. Some of them would have five guns instead of 30, so it ranged uh, uh, all the way uh, there. Um, what sort of an effect did they have? Uh, they had, a, uh, as time went by, they had a tremendous uh, effect. And if you read, if you read the uh, British uh, documents, you find out that the Admiralty, the Admiralty insisted that their effect was minimal. They were doing a great job uh, capturing these privateers. Uh, the Prime Minister supported the Admiralty's version of events. English merchants, however, and Scottish merchants were screaming in the newspapers uh, and in communications with the Admiralty that they couldn't even send their, their, their ships out of their own ports without them being captured by the Americans. Uh, and I have a wonderful communication from, from the merchants of Glasgow uh, to the Admiralty saying, what the hell are you talking about? Our insurance rates are sky high. We, send, we can't even send our vessels out on coastal uh, uh, voyages around the British Isles without being captured. Uh, and uh, that's where the Americans were. The Americans concentrated a lot of their privateers right, uh, right off of English, of English ports. Um, the English had a very big navy, but it was spread out uh, all over the place. When you think that the, of, of how many privateers we had, that's a lot, of, that's a lot to contend with. Uh, so it was, uh, uh, it was huge. And by the end of the war, the prime minister was really feeling that they were having having an impact. Now Lloyds of London said that the Americans captured uh, 1,200 uh, of our merchant vessels. 300 of them were uh, recaptured by the Royal Navy. Uh, in Baltimore, the newspaper that kept closest track of the, of the privateers uh, 
on our side thought that we captured 2,500, not 1,300. Uh, and, and the number of recaptures was much smaller than the Royal Navy was claiming. And this is what you find out about all the figures that anybody has on privateers. They vary all over the place, except for the one number, 526, that set out because Madison had assigned every commission. There has never been a good study of the privateers. Forget the revolution, we'll never have a good study of that. There might have been 2,000 privateers set out. For the War of 1812, uh, it's possible to have a study, but it would take a lifetime to, to get into uh, the, uh, the story of all of, these, of all of these ships. And of course, the captains lied about what they were doing. When you came into Marblehead, for instance, uh, what were you going to do, you know, because you didn't really didn't want people thinking you were profiteering from the war. Uh, Marblehead, Marblehead had some citizens who fought and died uh, during the war, and here you are, you're making a lot of money off the war. So uh, a lot of them, as they had in, uh, in the Revolutionary War, uh, lied about exactly how much they were making. Uh, they lied so much that a lot of historians think the privateers never made any money. Um, we used to have a business where, where the guy across the street was very similar to us and we would, we would be making money hand over fist when the economy was good and, and he was always doing poorly. No matter what happened, it was, it, business, was, business was awful. Uh, so you, uh, you, really, you really don't know. Some, some privateers uh, made a lot of money, some didn't obviously. We just don't know and getting at it really at it and getting an accurate accounting is, is uh, going to be impossible. The guy who wrote the best book on, on the War of 1812, outside of mine, <laughs> was Henry Adams. Henry Adams was the grandson of John Quincy Adams and the, and the great grandson of President John Adams. Uh, and, and he wrote his book in, in the latter part of the 19th century. I'm not going to give you a, a specific date because he wrote many editions. Uh, he said the first edition uh, is just the beginning, and he wrote, he wrote several editions. But it's a magnificent work. It's eight volumes. It covers Jefferson and Madison, um, and uh, beautifully, uh, beautifully written. And he has a wonderful chapter on privateers, uh, and he does the same thing that I do. Uh, when you get to privateers, you tell a few stories about individual privateers, uh, individual ships, maybe you talk about six, maybe you talk about ten, maybe you talk about a dozen, uh, but that's only a dozen out of 526. Then you start going and making generalizations about they did this and did that. But when you get to the generalizations part, it's, it's not based on any firm uh, um, uh, firm investigation. So at the end of this chapter, Adams concludes, uh, and I, I would say without unencumbered by the facts, uh, he concludes that the privateers were, lost money. It was a losing business. Never mind that, that, that these big houses were going up uh, and that, and that all, these, all these privateers were putting out uh, and, and they couldn't get out fast enough and they were risking their lives, and never mind all that, they were losing money. I conclude, based on the same evidence, but a whole lot more because, because of the intervening years and, and how much more we know, I conclude that they did very well. Uh, and, and, and most of my speculation is based on the fact that the English merchants were publicly screaming uh, in 1814 about about the uh, about the privateers, and I rely mostly mostly on that. I assume they were they were making money from their captures. So that's a long-winded no answer uh, to you. Yeah. If, if it was uh, 1,300 or 2,500 and some recaptured, what happened to the ships themselves that were captured? What happened to them? Yeah, did we did we suddenly wind up with a large navy here? What happened? What happens to the ships that? The, you mean the privateers themselves or those they captured? Those that they captured. They were just sold and became, they were sold to uh, merchants or groups of merchants. That's all. They were, they were, uh, and, and, and the money was given to, 
to the group of merchants who, all these privateers were, were owned by groups of people. Very few of them were owned by, let's say, one man or one firm or one, one family. Uh, so they would just simply be, uh, the money, they would get the money and the, and the ships would go back into the sure, merchant sure, fleet. ships or large boats uh, suddenly appeared along the coast of America. Yeah, exactly. The, 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 uh, um, the uh, uh, American trade after the war boomed. Uh, and and, uh, and this, this was part of, a part of it. There was a big English blockade off the coast uh, during the war. It, it got going, really got going, uh, by the middle of 1813. Uh, and um, a lot of our merchant ships were kept in port. They just simply didn't want to risk uh, going out. So these same merchants are the guys who funded the privateers. Uh, and it was, sometimes it was their own ships uh, that uh, that that went out. So it was a was a joint enterprise. These these uh, privateers, almost all of the ones that I've seen, were. There were a few that weren't big wealthy families, but very few of those. Yeah. What? I didn't hear what you. Oh, the Essex. Uh, the Essex was uh, uh, one of the, one of the great great. Uh, uh, ships, American warships, built in Salem uh, in a f during the uh, uh, war of, uh, against France, the Quasi War with France from 1798 to 1800. Uh, the Essex was completed at the end of uh, 1799. Uh, its captain, first captain, was a guy named Edward Preble from Portland, Maine, where I come from. Uh, and he was one of the great figures in, in American uh, uh, naval history. Um, and uh, the the uh, the story of the Essex and the building of the Essex is is a is a wonderful one. It was a subscription uh, ship, that, which meant that uh, a, a lot of the the merchants and wealthier people of Essex County contributed money to build it. It cost one hundred fifty thousand to build, and they con they contributed seventy five thousand. The rest came from uh, from the uh, federal government. Uh, this ship fought. Uh, not only in, in the Quasi War with France, but also all through the war with Tripoli, 1801 to 1805. Uh, it then was, was uh, in the Mediterranean for a couple of years and then brought back and put uh, in the Washington Navy Yard uh, for a number of years, just, just uh, in mothballs, brought back out for the, uh, for the War of 1812 and given to uh, David Porter. It was a 32-gun frigate, our smallest frigate. Um, and um, David Porter won the first victory in this in this uh, in the Essex, uh, August 12, 1812, uh, which I I mentioned earlier. But then he left on one of the great voyages in in American naval history. He left at the end of October from Chester, Pennsylvania. Chester, Pennsylvania used to be the colonial capital of of uh, Pennsylvania, and he owned a big mansion that right on the Chester River, it was the colonial governor's home at one time, and he parked the Essex right in front of it while it was, while it was being repaired. After he did what he did to the alert, he brought it to the Delaware River, parked it right in front of his house. They, they fixed it there, and off he went uh, at the end of October. Um, and uh, he, he then, it's a long story, I'll make it short, he then brought the Essex into the Pacific. It was the first American warship to enter the, enter the uh, Pacific Ocean. Around Cape Horn, he almost lost the ship a couple of times in, in, uh, in getting around uh, Cape Horn. Uh, he, then, he then destroyed the English uh, whale fishing industry along the uh, western coast of, uh, of South America. Uh, Whaling was of great importance to England, to their economy. Uh, the whale oil was used in, in, in innumerable ways uh, in England, and the English whaling industry was booming. And, he, and, and the richest whaling grounds at that time, this is, this is 1812, 1813, 1814, the rich, richest whaling grounds in the world were, were on the uh, 
west coast of South America all the way to the Galapagos Islands. The Galapagos Islands were the prime fishing grounds for, for whalers. The Galapagos are 500 miles off the coast of uh, Peru, roughly, uh, roughly that. Uh, Porter wiped their whole, whole business out there. American whalers were also uh, there. Uh, and he did this by the end of, of uh, 1813, and he decided his men needed a rest, and he needed to repair his ship in a place where the British couldn't get them. The British, of course, weren't too happy with what he was doing, and they sent some warships out after him. He knew they were coming, uh, and so he, he decided he needed to repair his ship and give the men some rest, uh, and, and so he, he, he took, he left the Galapagos Islands where he was, and traveled all the way to the Marquesas Islands. The Marquesas Islands are uh, the easternmost archipelago of the Polynesian Islands. And what do you think he expected uh, in, in the Marquesas Islands? What was he going there for? Was he going to repair his ship? Yes. And what were the men going to do uh, in their free time? <laughs> uh, so that's what they were going, uh, going there for. Uh, and it was a very good place because it was, it was quite a ways from Tahiti. Uh, and Tahiti was a place that the English frequented. But the Marquesas Islands, was a, they were really out of, out of the way. The English did not uh, usually go there. And so he was, he was, he was safe. He spent, he spent seven weeks there repairing the ship and having a good time. Uh, he experienced some of the same things that William Bly did on the, on the bounty. I remember, remember William Bly, uh, he, he, he let his men stay in Tahiti for five months. Not a good idea. Uh, Porter, Porter, limited, Porter had read all about Bly. He didn't want to report, repeat Bly's mistakes. Uh, and so he kept, he kept the time limited to seven weeks and he still had problems. He had, he had a near mutiny. He had a couple of them which he, which he dealt with because he was prepared, unlike, unlike Bly. I can't say poor Bly because poor Bly was a jerk. Uh, but anyway, after, after this, Porter, you would think, uh, would head back to the United States because he had, he had captured, while he was capturing these whalers, he, he took a lot of their oil. He had three shiploads of very valuable uh, sperm oil uh, that uh, he could have brought back to the United States. He didn't care. Uh, what he wanted to do was fight a British frigate, just like Isaac Hull had done in the Constitution against the Guerrier and his other, other colleagues had done. He, so instead of going home uh, and, 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 and collecting all the money that he, he had, uh, he went to Valparaiso where he knew the British would find him. They did find him there. A great battle occurred and he lost. He got beaten terribly. And, and he wasn't expecting to be beaten. Uh, and he was very angry. And while he was fighting this awful battle, he went on and on instead of surrendering way beyond the time he should have. Uh, and so he got, he got dozens of his men killed and wounded unnecessarily. Uh, anyway, um, he lost and the English captain who beat him uh, allowed him to return to the United States with, with the men who, who were uninjured. Uh, and uh, they returned to the United States and Porter made it back here in July of, of 1815. Uh, the British by that time, of course, had captured the Essex at Valparaiso. It was all shot up, two and a half hours of pounding uh, by, by two, two British warships, good, solid, powerful British warships. It would have destroyed any other ship, didn't the Essex. You can think of how the Essex was, how strong it was, how wonderfully built it was. Here's a ship built in 1799 that, that uh, in 1814 gets this terrible pounding. The English captain repaired it enough, took it to Rio de Janeiro, round Cape Horn, and took it back to England. And it was in the English Navy until, until 1838 if you can believe it. That was, that's how well built the USS. And when you think about it and how it ended, it makes you cry. Wouldn't it be nice if it was, if it was right over here and we could show all our kids this, this uh, great warship. Porter landed in July in New York. Uh, 
and 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 uh, the he didn't know what what how he was going to be be treated because he had been defeated. Uh, he had lost this great warship. So um, Madison greeted him as a hero. Madison said, "I don't care about about the defeat." Uh, he was looking at at how well they fought in Valparaiso and uh, at what he had done to the English fishery. But more than that, Madison needed heroes. Uh, and, and Porter was treated as if he had won a great a victory in Valparaiso. And for, for, for ever after, he is, his, his episode in Valparaiso has been praised. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt praised him, Madison praised him, Alfred Thayer Mahan praised him, on and on and on. Um, I'm not so praised, I'm not so, I'm not, I'm not in that camp, although he had many good features. That's a long story. <laughs>